All right, everybody. So I apologize in advance to anybody who wanted to give a lightning talk and couldn't. If we go fast enough, we might be able to have some people jump up here, but probably not. It's a really good sign when there are more people that want to speak than there is time. And that is definitely something we can work on for future DCOMs, to have more than just a single hour. If everyone could uh, take their seats again. You'll be able to talk to each other after this. No one is vanishing that I know of. So as I said, we're going to have a special talk right before to kick off the lightning talks from Hatem, who works at Sociomantic. He wants to share an open source library with all of you. So this is about a, a quarter talk, if you will. It should be about 15 minutes. Uh, we may have time for questions. But otherwise, if you are scheduled to do a lightning talk, please be ready to jump on stage. And with that, Hatem, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so hello everyone. I'm Hatem Orabi. Uh, I work in Sociomantic. I use the on a daily basis for almost the last five years. Uh, so last year, we talked that we're going to uh, open source our uh, user library that we use in uh, Sociomantic, and we've done that, but we haven't had the chance to talk about it. Uh, so today, we are going to talk about uh, quickly an introduction and go through a couple of components that uh, uh, in Ocean. So just to begin, what's Ocean? It's a general purpose library. Uh, it's an open source project, uh, basically Boost license. There are some other few licenses, but check file by file if you need, but for the most part, it's Boost. It's based on Tango for you who are old enough to remember Tango. It has a strong focus on scalability and performance for, re for real-time applications. It, basically, we achieve that through reusing buffers, uh, object pools, and uh, pre-allocating exceptions, something debatable, but yeah, uh, minimizing the garbage collector cycles and basically through the previous uh, techniques. Uh, it assumes a single thread environment. It assumes Linux. It might work on other platforms, but if it didn't, then we don't consider it a bug. Uh, it has strong focus on maintainability using uh, semantic versioning. We have our own standard, and basically what it attempts to do is that we even when you go from other than the classical semantic versioning, when you go from a major branch to the next, we try not to break your code and give you a migration path where you have something deprecated in version, for example, three, and then when you go, and then at version three, you would have the alternative that you will be uh, used in version four. Anyhow, uh, so basically the code is in D1. Uh, that we're currently still in uh, D1 for the most part. However, you can use a conversion tool that we have uh, open sourced, and then you get uh, D2 Ocean. It's auto converted code, and however, for a few uh, versions behind the compiler, uh, we're currently at 2.70. Uh, for the most part, we reuse exceptions, and we want to set the exception message in the compiler so we can throw exceptions uh, and reu reuse them. However, we, to do that, we need to introduce a new symbol in the exception, and we don't want to break uh, other people's code when we do that. So we want to introduce first the future symbol, which is currently a DIPM uh, under uh, review. Uh, so you can use Ocean either through Dub. It's very recent that we've added that a couple of minutes ago. So uh, you can use GitHub. Uh, D2 Ocean, uh, that's basically an auto-converted auto from D1. However, if you want to use the latest, then please use uh, the main one in D1, and then there is the README there on how to, to build it and use it. OK, uh, so there is a lot inside Ocean. And yeah, the 15 minutes are never going to be enough. Uh, there is around, I think, 550 modules, uh, more or less. And yeah. This is not even doing it fair. Uh, so there are a few ones. My favorite ones, at least, are the f these five. Um, well, there is no time. I'll talk about the five. But basically, task system is a nice way to, it's fiber and strides. Uh, it's a nice way to uh, manage your application, the code flow. There is the maps and the caches. The maps are basically hash sets and hash maps. and 
uh, they're more um, predictable than associative arrays, and they, you know exactly what's going to happen uh, with them. Uh, as for the serializer and the app framework, we'll talk about this quickly as an example of what's in Ocean. So we have contiguous deserializer and serializer, and basically, uh, a serializer, for those who don't know, is a, a tool that converts the code from one format to another. And then what you want to do with that is that you can use it and then store it in a file, store it in a database, uh, send it over the network. So we have the contiguous uh, serializer, which converts structs to binary data. And it favors speeds over size and convenience. And by size, it doesn't do any compression. By convenience, like a normal or like a convenience would be that it needs a buffer, it would allocate it for you. No, it wouldn't do that. You need to provide the buffer so you get a better performance. Uh, it supports the structs of primitive types, nested structs, arrays, including arrays of arrays, embedded all that inside them, and unions. What it doesn't support is reference types, reference types, it's reference types except for arrays, uh, and unions containing arrays. So normal unions are OK, but unions containing array aren't allowed and then constant immutables. It supports something really cool, I think, which is incremental versioning. We'll talk about that later. So just to give a quick example, consider this is your heap, and consider for sake of discussion that you have struct as heap allocated. And then what you have here is that you have x equal 4 to an integer, and then an array. The array would have a length and a pointer, and the pointer would be mapping somewhere else in your heap, and then this is what you have. And what the contiguous serializer would do is that it would put all of that together right after each other, so you can send it through the network and then give it to, or send, uh, save it in a file. And basically what it does in this case is that it would put your struct, the whole struct there, it would any, any uh, arrays it would find, it would set uh, to init uh, um, null, and then would put for each thing that it finds here, would put it there, and then it would put the content of the array. The design, maybe if you have any comments about this design, please talk to David Hart. He designed it, and he's responsible to defend his design. Uh, as for the contiguous, the versioning part, I think it's actually pretty cool. Uh, basically, consider that you have a struct uh, like, and that you store the user ID inside it. And then initially, you were just storing the user ID as an integer. After some time, you grew wiser, and maybe not, and you decided to store it as a string. And what you want to do now is that you have in the wild some structs that were with version 1 and some structs with version 2. And what you want to be able to do is basically use the binary data from version 1 and then convert it automatically to version 2 without breaking anything. So basically, the way to do that is to first tell the serializer which version is each one. So you tell it struct version 1, struct version 2. The, the serializer will look for this information at compile time to use to know which version is which. The next thing you need to tell version 2, what is version 1? And then you tell struct previous is user 1. It would look for that as well. Then what you need to do, uh, just for sake of display, I'm going to switch it so we can have more space. Uh, afterwards, we need to tell the serializer needs to know that finds id as a string, and it didn't exist in version 1. It doesn't know how to convert that, so you need to explicitly tell it how to convert version 1 to, uh, from version 1 to version 2, and uh, how to convert, convert id as a string. It would look for convert underscore the name of the variable. If it didn't find that, it would complain at compile time. Uh, then, yeah, here, ideally, you shouldn't uh, allocate here, but for sake of simplicity, we're just using uh, this method. Uh, what's cool generally, like one cool feature is that uh, when you do that, if you by mistake change, for example, something in user one and you forgot to bump your version to the next version, uh, the serializer would dump a hash of the value of the types that are in the struct. And if it, and if it loads the new struct and finds that the hash mis mismatches, it would complain to you. And this is like a safety guarantee that you get at compile time. So, no, I mean, basically compile time and runtime together. Um, so consider now that you have structure with a three, and now you're more wise, and you're using the ID, storing the ID as a hash. 
how, and you still have I, uh, version one. And what you can do now is that you can have the user data from binary data, and then it, the serializer would go from version one to version two and version two to version three. It needs, of course, to find all the appropriate conversion functions. What you need afterward, afterwards, uh, I mean, what you can do also is that you can go backwards. However, so from version one, you can load version three. However, you need to, to tell each one of them what the next struct is. OK, so that's for the serializer. Let's go to another component in uh, an Ocean, which is the app framework. It provides a common utilities to build your application. It's filling the blanks to the large extent. So most of the stuff are done for you, and then you get a lot of freebies, so to say. And it supports command line parsing, integration with config files, integration with loggers, daemon support, signal handling. OK, so here's a minimal version of what you want to do. You, have, you, you uh, inherit the daemon app. You give it an app name, a description of the, of the app. And then there is the vision information. The vision information contains, from the most part, the build information, what compiler was which compiler was used, uh, which libraries with which commits, and all these kinds of things. And you can automatically generate that, but that's out of the scope of this talk. So if you want to know about that, come talk to me after the talk. And basically here, what you get is just hello world, and we don't do anything. So let's try to run that. You try to run it, and because it's a daemon app, it expects that there is a config file and there is a logger, a log logging directory. So you try to run it. It says, oops, I didn't find etc config.i and i. Uh, so what you can do, you can override this value with other values, but yeah, uh, just to know. So let's try the help. Without doing anything, we get all this stuff, configuration, the help, the version, and a few other things. And this is the application name, my app name, and my app short description. OK, so now let's just try to make it print anything. So we make the etc and the config file, an, an empty config file. We make the logging directory. Now we run it. We get a hello world. OK, not much. Now let's fill the config file with something proper. So the way to declare a config file is basically would be my preferred way, at least, is to have a struct with the section config. So we have net op options, and then you have a proxy. By default, it has an empty value. And then you can require that certain parameter, like port, is required, that it has a minimum and maximum value. And it's, uh, and yeah, and we have the use HTTP as by default, it's um, true. And then what you would have, you ha need to do two things. First, you need to create your config file, and then you add the net section, and you give it the proxy and port. This needs to match to what here. If something is not present in the config file, then it would, uh, it would take the default value from here, unless it's required. And then what you need afterwards to do is tell it to map the section part to, um, to this part, in the, uh, the, the net part in, in the config file, to your struct, to your uh, struct instance. OK, so there is logger um, integration with that. You just there is, by default, there is the log root. It's the magic value the, the application will look for. It, you can define which, which, which parts do you give the logger. The logger comes from uh, Tango loggers. Um, so you give it the default information, and then you can create any logger lookup. It uses hierarchical lookups. And then you can start doing info logging message. If info here is as this or more, or like fatal or error, then it'd be printed. If it's trace, it would be refused. And then you have what you can do per like, specific level um, loggers. And basically, you can say, OK, level one, level two. And then it's trace. Yes, this is trace. It would fit, uh, match, so it would do that. OK, also the command line argument parsing. It's pretty cool. It's a bit different than uh, get ops and um, d2. Uh, achieves the same thing, but a bit different. Uh, it comes also from Tango for the most part. Uh, you have, for example, you can add, uh, declare a user called user. You give it a short name. You say it's a required param parameter, and then you give it the help. And then you have, for example, another thing called GitHub account and build bucket. And you say params equal zero. That means, for the most part, that it's going to be Boolean. And then you say it conflicts with big bucket, uh, bit bucket, and for the bit bucket, conflicts with GitHub. And that you must provide it with the user, and then the help message. OK, let's try that. 
my at help, you get the previous parts and a few other things. Now the things, user, GitHub, Bitbucket. Now if you do my app, user is missing. Now user and GitHub and Bitbucket, they conflict with each other. It complains about that. OK, so that's for the most part that two components to show. Now the take home message is to remember that Ocean is a library with a focus on maintainability and performance for real-time applications. It provides app framework is a nice way if you have a long-term application or something to hack and then you want a proper support in a way, then you fill in the blanks with that one. Um, Contiguous serializer is a very nice way to manage your data. It helps you for the most part uh, to keep versioning what sometimes you can do is that you can have even a live server where we have different versions and then you have the readers and the writers and then you can get some up and some down. And because each of them can write different versions, they work nicely together without having downtime or getting the, putting the system down to do an update. Yeah, before implementing something new, check if Ocean already has implemented it. And yeah, pull requests are welcome. Okay, so any questions and for, yeah, go here, pick up Ocean D1, Ocean D2, whatever you like, and have fun there. Yeah. Questions? So very awesome that uh, Tango is still alive because there's still some old code from me inside there. <laughs> but uh, I moved on and uh, we heard that Speed Matters uh, does Ocean 2 support LDC. Yeah, uh, we haven't tried yet our code with LDC, uh, Ocean. Like, if, you're, if it was part there and still used, then we've, we've ported it to Ocean D2. However, uh, we still, I said, was at, with DMD at 2.70, so we even didn't start yet uh, experimenting with LDC and other, uh, or uh, GC, uh, GDC. So that's coming hopefully soon, but when we move there. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Um, I saw a comment on the, I think maybe the second side or something that is mostly boost licensed. And so actually my question then is how interlinked is the, uh, the whole library and is it easy to kind of rip out something and only use that part or do I have to use the whole library? It should be possible for that part. Uh, some parts are independent on other parts and it should be at that point uh, that the file at that, the license at that file should apply just to that file. No, uh, then this, maybe this I understand, but I uh, just okay. Uh, Luca, he has managed more the licensing, so he can answer better. I had the pleasure to deal with all the licenses <laughs> issues, let's say. Uh, basically, is all the code that we produce is licensed uh, through the Boost license, but there is a lot of Tango code there that we couldn't relicense. So Tango actually is dual license and it's BSD three clause and artistic license. As far as I know, I'm not a lawyer, um, the BSD 3 clause uh, license should be compatible with the Boost license. So if you want to only use one license, that will be the BSD 3 clause. All the code should be fine with that license. If you want to use Boost or artistic license, then you have to check the files to see which one. Thanks, Luca. And thanks, Hatem. Thank you. If you want to ask uh, Hatem more questions, just grab him uh, down on the floor. I will.